seated. Today, I want to talk about something that, uh, that you know, it, it's important for us as believers. Important for us as believers. Um, one of the accusations that you will get from the unbelieving world is that Christians are, are hypocrites. Well, that, that's certainly true, as in there are a lot of Christians that are not living the actual Christian life. I mean, they'll, they'll do religious things and they use religious language, but their life is inconsistent with the gospel and with the word of God. Uh, but there is a distinction, okay? So no Christian is perfect, right? So perfection is not the actuality. Only God is perfect. All of us, by grace, become perfected, enter into a process of, of being perfected. Um, but there is a, a problem when we are not making any progress and we've actually become satisfied uh, and actually allow ourselves to be totally inconsistent with the gospel. So for instance, as a pastor, if you find out that I'm lying and I'm, I'm uh, fornicating and adulterating and stealing and, and so on and so forth, that you know, once we're done here, I go off and live this alternate life, it negates everything that we stand for, correct? And so that, that really is a problem for us. So here's a thing to think about. I'm not picking on any particular sin, okay? I'm just trying to get some illustration here. There are things that you know are bad for you and wrong for you, and yet you still do them. Anybody have that trouble? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why is it that we don't experience the full victory of Jesus Christ in our lives? His uh, death, burial and resurrection is a point of victory. We are actually meeting on the day of resurrection, not on the Sabbath. We're, deeding, we're meeting on the day of resurrection because resurrection is what the faith of believers in Christ is all about. The cross is the death and the, and the, and the pain and the payment, but it's the resurrection that is really what brings us to a new place in life. So, you know, here's kind of a question. How long have we known that cigarettes are bad for you? Huh? How long? Seriously, I mean, how long? <laughs> no, we didn't know it originally. <laughs> yeah. Definitely since the 70s. The Surgeon General has a warning on every pack of cigarettes and every carton. What is that warning? They're dangerous to your health. Right? And yet every convenience store, grocery store, every retail by and large has what? Cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're coming to know that pornography is bad for us. We're, we're coming to know that. And yet we are producing it in, in, in unmeasurable amounts, <laughs> unbelievable amounts. It is completely accessible to everybody all the time, everywhere. You can watch pornography right here, right now. It's, it's completely free and accessible to you. So why do we do that? Why do we act like it's not a problem? Why do we have hashtag me too and never actually realize there is a warning? It's not the Surgeon General, okay? But it's God himself who says that this stuff does not work and doesn't help us. How about this? How about food? How about, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Now I'm in big trouble. Because this, this, is, this is our favorite Christian vice. So, you know, again, you know, the issue for us is that we know we shouldn't and we do, right? You know, I eat a whole half gallon of ice cream because I'm not a quitter. That's, that's. <laughs> you can quit if you want. I throw the lid away. There's no point in it. So again, you know, you know, why do we do the things that are not good for us? Why do I get mad at my family? Why do I not go to bed? Why do I not get up? <laughs> Why do I do the things that I know are bad for me? Why do we do that? I don't want to talk about how bad we are. We all know that we have problems. And that's not the issue, actually. The question is, how do we be become victorious over these problems. 
How do we become victorious? So today, I kind of want to talk about those things that happen in our lives that get in the way. They get in the way. And what ends up happening, actually, is that we start living a secret life. A secret life. And that secret life ends up taking over our whole life. It controls everything. It controls it all. And you know, here's a funny thing. You can get rid of one bad behavior, and if you don't, call, if you don't actually solve the real reason for it, you'll just swap one for another. Amen? So you know, if you go to an AA meeting, one of the things you'll find out is that there's a lot of people that smoke. <laughs> You know, that's part of the reason why some AA meetings are not in churches is because a lot of AA meetings, there's a lot of smokers. And so, you know, of course, they'll tell you, you know, look, let's get rid of the alcohol. Let's deal with one thing at a time. But there's a tendency not to deal with the other either. But the reason is this, okay? And there's such a thing as a dry drunk. Do you know what a dry drunk is? It's a person who got rid of alcohol, but they didn't get rid of the problem. And man, I'm telling you what, when people deal with a dry drunk, this is what they'll say. You know, you were better when you drank. <laughs> Unless they were really mean when they, get, when they drank, then of course, that would not be true. What I want you to understand is this. Christianity, Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, they literally do things in your life that you cannot do without them. They solve actual problems in your life. They solve the actual issues that you cannot deal with. But there are some things that are, you know, some things that are missing. All right. Um, my youngest son would tell me about his early life a little bit. And one of the things that he would tell me is that, Dad, you know, uh, I actually went to church when I was a little kid. And some parts of his family, uh, his birth family, they actually we're religious leaders or sort of, you know, anyway, but he said, as soon as church was over, then everything that was destructive was happening. And he said, it was very confusing, very confusing as a child. And of course they didn't take care of the kids, you know? And so that's another part of it. And what I want you to understand is that inconsistency, that hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then just Katie bar the door on everything else as soon as the hallelujah praise the Lord's over. You understand what I'm talking about? So I want us to understand this. This work and that it carries on and is completed in us in Christ Jesus. In Colossians chapter one, it says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now, this is something of what we've actually been doing over the last 10 weeks, and really uh, for more than that, because that's the foundation of creation. Understanding that God made everything and everything is about God and comes from God and is for God. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head, you get this? He is the head of the body, the church. So he's, now it's not just that he's creator, because everybody's been made, right? But not everybody recognizes God as creator and, and certainly does not recognize him as savior. But for those who do actually recognize Jesus Christ as their savior, recognize God as their Father and the Holy Spirit as their indwelling power, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The head of the church. Do you understand what that means? Okay, now some of us are going to play that, my big fat Greek wedding phrase. Yes, the man is the head, but what? The neck is the woman and turns the head. So, you know, So, you know, Jesus Christ is ahead, but we still have free choice. Do you understand that? 
We still have free choice. We still have the ability to choose. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is talking about the full sovereignty, full divine, fully miraculous nature of Jesus Christ. Okay? You have to understand this. Everything for life is in Jesus Christ. The power. Okay? I'm telling you right now, if Jesus Christ got a hold of the government of the United States, we would become a totally different country. There'd be a lot less need for locks, a lot less need for penal, because people would actually be much kinder, much gentler, much more moral, much stronger, so on and so forth. We would have a whole lot better life. I want you to understand this, because in the fullness of Christ is the fullness and the deity of God. Everything is held together by him. But we have free choice. We have free choice. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. So he has this amazing position and power, and he is, through him, reconciling everything to himself. He is rebuying everything he's lost. He is purchasing with his life. Okay? Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I got in a lot of trouble. And some of it had to do with alcohol, some of it had to do with just being, you know, wild and crazy and, and so on and so forth. But it cost me $3,500. And two years without a driver's license. Now, I was 17 years old. I didn't have a driver's license. I mean, I didn't have $3,500. Okay? Where do you think I got it? My dad. My dad gave it to me. $3,500. Now, I worked for my father because my father. My family had their own business. My father was his own boss and so on. I worked for him, you know, so on and so forth. And he actually never gave me a salary. He just gave me everything I needed. So when I needed a car, he gave me a car. When I wanted to go fishing, I, he gave me the money to go fishing. When I wanted to go on a trip, he gave me the money for the trip. Whatever I needed, not all I wanted, but whatever I needed, he gave it to me. But here's the thing. God has everything to redeem us, and that's what Jesus Christ is doing. He's redeeming us to himself, okay? I'll never forget when I went into Boulder County Courthouse and I stood before the judge, I had no idea that my dad had already gone back in the back room with the judge and solved the whole thing. Everything was already taken care of. I had no idea that my dad had done that for me. He got the charge lessened, he got everything changed, so on and so forth. Now, that was my father bestowing upon me things I, what? Didn't deserve. So what I want you to understand is when you read this, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, were on earth or in heaven, making peace. This is, this is the key. I can tell you right now, the reason you do the things that you do that you don't want to do and the reason you don't do the things that you do want to do is because you don't have peace. Making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you Holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Okay, so what he does is he cleans us up. He gives us the transaction that he actually enacted on the cross and out of the grave, and he gives that to us. Okay, so that day in Boulder, I walked out a free man. Now I had some things I had to do. Okay, I mean, I did have to pay the $3,500. I did have to walk for two years, and I did have to do 500 hours of community service, okay, which was an extremely beneficial thing to the Polk County people. But the bottom line is, is that I was free. How'd I get free? By the grace of the court, and by the grace of my father, 
and so on and so forth. I didn't get what I deserved. I got something else. I got something else. <laughs> I'll never forget showing up in Polk County. My first thing I had to do was go down to the courthouse and talk to the judge there at the courthouse, and I had to get his written agreement and uh, uh, authorization that I am here and that I am going to do this work and I'm going to prove it and I'm going to prove it to him. Otherwise, I'm in big trouble back in Boulder. I had to actually do the work and the services on You want to know how much fun it is to be a pastoral student in the school of theology and to go to the courthouse and say, hi, my name is Dave Mason. I'm here to be a pastor and I have to do 500 community service hours if you don't mind. I mean, that's really... I mean, that's really a humbling experience, amen? My first act as a going to be a preacher boy was to go to court and take my due, due punishment. But the bottom line is, is that I was not getting what I deserved. What? I was getting the grace and the goodness of God. By the way, I enjoyed that work at Polk County. I enjoyed those people and I enjoyed everything I did there. So I want you to understand that God is, is actually bringing us to reconciliation and taking off of us the blame and the reproach and the shame. And he gives us something that we cannot do on our own. But then in verse 23, it says, if indeed you continue, doesn't do any good to pay a fine, walk, community service, if I don't what? Quit what I got in trouble for in the first place. Okay? Drinking and driving, running from the police, and doing things to other people in traffic, if I don't stop it, it doesn't do any good at all. Amen? And I want you to understand if indeed you continue in the faith, notice this, stable and steadfast. And not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Now, there was another thing that was going on for me when I showed up in Bolivar, Missouri. It wasn't just that I was dealing with, you know, the, the adverse conditions of my behavior. But it was also the fact that I was dealing with the loss of my sister. And how could a God who is good allow my younger sister to be crushed and killed. And then how could I, in all that I knew, didn't help her with anything? Those are all really hard questions for me. But I remember coming to the place and understanding that Jesus Christ is my only hope. My only hope. And I remember him showing me that he loved me and I can't explain it to you because it's one of those things that, that's just dynamic, you know what I mean? It's one of those things that happens to you. It, not, it doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't always happen that, that way. But it happened to me and it changed me instantly, totally, and completely forever and ever. Amen. And even though I had had trouble continuing in the faith and being stable and steadfast and not shifting, that was no longer true in my life, actually. I was never, ever, ever going to give up Jesus Christ again. Never. Now, does that mean that I didn't commit any sins from then on? Yes, you can call me Saint David. <laughs> if you can get that trash out of your mouth, I mean, it's not true. But in Jesus Christ, it is true, amen? I am something else that I cannot and do not have the ability to actually achieve. But Jesus Christ is working in my life. And then the other thing is, is that now I'm no longer on my own. I have other people that are helping me and encouraging me. Which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And of which I, Paul, became a minister. A minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That saves people and grows people and matures people to the fullness of Jesus Christ.
everything okay with you? I don't know. Um, no. I mean, I puked in front of a bunch of little kids and I told everybody I'm pregnant, so. Yeah, I don't think that's really okay, is it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. the question, are you okay? I don't know her life story, but I know that that moment when she answered truthfully, that's when everything actually changed. And that's when she began to experience something that she could not experience on her own. It's really hard to tell the truth, isn't it? Huh? Yes. It's really hard to tell the truth about ourselves. One of the things that really concerns me about the church is that, not just this church, but church in general, is the games that we play with ourselves. If you go back to that passage in Colossians, you know, and it talks about stable and steady. Not shrinking back. See, once you come to Christ, and that's salvation is something only God can actually do in your life. I mean, you cannot do that on your own. There's no way you can do that. So it's a miraculous thing that takes place in your life. But once Jesus Christ comes into your life and arrests your mind and heart, amen? You know what I'm talking about? Get arrested, <laughs> okay? He takes hold of it. And then you start making some mistakes. What do we do when we make those mistakes? We start hiding them. We're like the Wizard of Oz. Don't look at the guy behind the curtain. I am the great and wonderful Oz. No, you're a little guy over here, <laughs> you know, playing like you are. And what I want you to understand is this. This is really, really important. The church needs to be a place where people can honestly answer the question, are you okay? Are you okay? Where when we answer that question, we don't get judged. We don't get thrown away. We get help from each other. Because I'm telling you right now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, absolutely essential. But there's another part that needs to come in there. And that's called the church. The church. Jesus Christ called us to be helpers of each other, equippers of one another, to encourage each other, not to be pretenders who play like we're all okay when we're what? We're not. We're not. The day that young lady admitted that she was not pregnant, she was drunk, and she puked because she was hung over, was the day that she actually began to experience the redemption, the freedom from the thing that was troubling her so much. 
There's no end to the things that can actually trouble us. This is one of my favorite parts of the Bible, okay? There's a lot of reasons. One, it's from a guy named David, which I've got some identity there. And uh, it, it's from his worst moment as I can see in life. I mean, everybody wants to talk about Goliath, okay? But nobody wants to talk about Bathsheba. Nobody wants to talk about that moment where you really do prove that you're a sinner. Even though you know God, love God, and have been faithful and experienced the power of God, you still can do things that are totally contrary to who you are in Christ. So here's David's cry in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Now, he's not naming just one. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, notice, he's asking God to do these things, okay? He's not saying, God, I'll never do it again. Anybody have success with that? For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It's been my problem since birth. That's all he's saying. Behold, you delight, what? In truth, in the inward being. This is the place where we really find victory. Truth in the inward being. Because as long as somebody says, are you okay? And we say, yeah, I'm fine. And we lie, we're trapped. We're stuck there forever. Until we answer that question, what? Truthfully. You know, I use a sword a lot of times, I bring it in and stuff. Now, it's a double-edged sword, amen? It's a double-edged sword, okay? It cuts two ways, okay? There's one where we actually receive the truth, and then there's another where we tell the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And this is the really important part for us, because what happens is the devil doesn't mind us coming to Christ as much if we live inconsistent with that. Because then he's got it where he wants it. And he makes us disabled. But the fact is, is that all we have to do is what? Tell the truth. Tell the truth about where we are. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the what? Secret heart. Have you ever found yourself doing things and you're like... Where'd that come from? You ever have a thought and you're like, my goodness, I'm glad nobody heard that. Huh? You bet. You bet. There is an unconscious part of you, okay? All right? Remember I've showed you this before? Put your fingers together. Go ahead, do it. Put your fingers together, all right? Okay, left thumb tops, raise your arms. Left thumb tops, okay, good. Right thumb tops, raise yours. All right, see, got some weirdos here. All right, so then, <laughs> then switch them completely, switch it completely, and put the other thumb on top, and all the fingers corresponding, it just feels weird. It feels weird. And you're not even conscious of these things, okay? Folding your arms, same thing. Same thing, folding your arms. You can't, you know, it's, it's a whole other thing. Now, here's what I want you to understand is this. Teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Down deep inside. In actuality, in my mind. In my mind. Because your mind is where everything takes place. Why do I do the things that I do that I know I shouldn't do? Because I'm not allowing myself to be truthful and to experience the power of the fellowship 
or experience the power of the truth. The truth. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 8. Let me, hear the, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me what? A clean heart. Okay. Oh God. And renew a right spirit. It is possible for us to pollute our hearts and to grieve the spirit and to grieve the spirit. And it will not change until we recognize it. Okay, so how did David come to know? How did he actually come to be free of all the sin that he committed in relationship to what he did with Bathsheba? How did that happen? Okay, I, I hear a name. What name am I hearing? Nathan. Who was Nathan? He was a prophet who came to David and told him what? He told him the truth. You're the man. Okay. David couldn't admit it to himself. He couldn't admit it to himself. And he was covering all, and it took him farther. I mean, it's one thing to have sin with Bathsheba. It's another thing, what? To murder her husband and cover it up. She's pregnant. I mean, has much changed? <laughs> Doesn't seem that way to me. Okay, but the bottom line is, is that God sent Nathan to do what? To set David free. It grieved him deeply, made him very sad. But the fact is, is that God actually created in him a clean heart and renewed a new spirit. Cast me not away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Your salvation, notice, the joy of your salvation. The work that only God can do in your life. Okay, if you, are, if you are living by your own ability, then you are not grateful. You're arrogant. But when you live by the grace of God, when you live by the, the forgiveness and the mercy of God, you experience something called joy. And it's a, a, a well springing up inside of you. And so I want you to understand here what happens is, is that David's coming back to the reality of his salvation and he's doing it by telling the truth. Telling the truth about himself and dealing with the truth within him. And God is restoring the joy of his salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will not return, will return to you. And I want you to get this. I don't know how many people, they justify their bad behavior because they've got scales. And they're like, well, I read the Bible. Now I talk to people about Jesus and so on and so forth. I'll, you know, I'll never forget a guy that was in prison and I was talking to him. I didn't realize that this actually went on. He told me all about how what great a Christian he is and all that good stuff. And then I said, well what, well, what about you trying to kill your wife? Well, the sheriff's got it in for me. <laughs> no, I was so stupid. I went to the sheriff and I said, hey, this guy actually says you got it in for him. <laughs> It's, I'm sure the sheriff was kind not to just throw me out on my tail. He said, well, son, I just want to tell you that the guy had his hands around her neck and, and was literally, her, her face was a different color and I pulled him off of her. Okay. But he was telling me all this religion and all this stuff. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is, is that the reality is, is that he literally cannot tell people about God because he doesn't actually deal with them on his own self. I mean, he had no message. And truthfully, I had to quit letting him come to the Bible study in the jail because all he did is kept everybody else from coming to Jesus because he was totally hypocritical, totally against things, even though he had a whole bunch of knowledge. And what I want you to understand is no one is ever going to come to Jesus until you come to Jesus because you have no message to tell about Jesus until you do. And I don't have a message about how great I am. I have a message about how bad I am and how good God is and how his grace works in my life. And I want to tell you something. For you and I, what I want us to understand today is I want us to know we cannot teach anyone else until we've been taught ourselves until we've come to the truth ourselves. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. 
O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. There's all the way through the Bible. I just wanted you to see these Old Testament verses. Ezekiel eleven nineteen says, And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them, and I will take the heart of stone. What is a heart of stone? A person who is unwilling to be changed. A person who is unwilling to be changed. That's a heart of stone. God says, I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them what? A heart of flesh that can be molded and formed. A growing, dynamic heart. In Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know me. For I am the Lord and they will be my people and I will be their God. For they will return to me with what? Their whole heart. When you pretend like you're okay when you're not, are you being whole? Are you being pure? Are you telling the truth? No. In Ezekiel 36, 26, it, as a matter of fact, the whole book of Ezekiel is actually all about the heart. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And this is my actual favorite reality is, oh, did I not show that? Yeah. Philippians chapter one says this, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, do you notice that? Let me, let me give this to you, okay? If you let your behavior keep you from experiencing the forgiveness and the goodness of God, then you will actually be trapped and you'll not get free. Because what happens is, is that now we start playing a game. Okay? Instead of being honest about what's really going on in our lives, we start playing a game. And it isn't until we come to the thing of saying, God, I am not willing ever anymore to be ashamed of you and of the work that you do in people's lives. Okay, why do we keep things hidden? Because we're ashamed of what? Of ourselves. <laughs> we're ashamed of ourselves. When you come to God, you come to God, it doesn't matter what happens anymore. Okay, Zacchaeus. What did Zacchaeus do? Everybody's blah, 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 blah. Okay. What did Zacchaeus do? He saw Jesus. Jesus called him and he declared out loud in front of everybody, I'll pay everybody back more than I even paid you, that I took from you. Okay. That's giving up control. That's giving up control. How about the woman at the well? How about the woman at the well? What did Jesus do with her? He told everything about her life. If I brought you up right now and started telling everything and I know it all, you'd be a little scared, wouldn't you? Huh? Yeah. But she wasn't. She went to town and told everybody, I have met a man who is the Messiah who told me everything, revealed everything about my life. And they all came out and spent two days with Jesus and he did the same thing to the whole town. And what I want you to understand is my hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full confidence, full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is what? Christ, and to die is gain. And the reason that is, is because Jesus Christ works in our lives. We are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of God's grace. We're not ashamed of our sin, as in we're too unwilling to admit that we have problems. We come to God because he what? Loves us and forgives us. We need the fellowship of the body 
to be able to do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you would admit to somebody the real struggle that you're having and begin to pray with them and let them pray for you, you will actually experience victory in your life like you've never experienced before. Now, folks, I've been with you a long time and I've seen some of the things in your life and you've seen some of the things in my life. And I know where some of you come from. I know some of the things that actually have taken place in your life. I've seen your struggles. But here's what I know. When you and I do it together, it goes a whole lot better. Amen? It goes a whole lot better. And I want to encourage you to understand this. Do not stop following the gospel of Jesus Christ because now, as a believer, you're making mistakes. Let the gospel continue to work in your life and in the fellowship of believers. So one of the things that I'm hoping that our church will do is that we'll start being honest with each other and that we'll experience a life in Christ like we could never do on our own. So that our lives are a testimony and not actually, what? A distraction or a reason not to believe. My sister called me today and I was really happy. This is what she said. She said, David, I need to find a church. Please help me find a, what? Good church, okay? Why would she ask me to help her find a good church? Because not all churches are good. Huh? When the pastor's a homosexual, you think that's good? No. 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 The fact is, and it's not just homosexual, okay? If the, if the pastor doesn't believe the Bible, if the people are living inconsistent, if everybody's being hateful and nobody's being you know, honest and sincere, there's no forgiveness, there's no encouragement, there's no kindness, there's no care, there's no real love, then it's not a, a place you can go and get fixed. The fact is, is that you have to have a place where the gospel carries on and continues. So to be sure that you and I understand I want to encourage us as a church to be very, very honest about where we really are and to experience the actual work of God in our lives to give us a life that we could not determine our own. Then, then we will teach transgressors his ways. We will teach transgressors how you can be saved, okay? Okay? Um, this week, my, uh, sister's son-in-law, uh, my niece's husband, 33 years old, he had a massive heart, heart attack and died in his kitchen. And so he passed away just like that. Two little boys and so on. But here's, here's the, here's the thing. Okay. My family has asked me to share at the, uh, funeral. Why would they ask me to share? Why would they ask me to share? <laughs> because my life is not a hypocrisy. I don't have any glory in me. My family knows exactly what I have and can do. But they also know what? What God can do. Amen? It's not me. Is God. And I want to encourage us to be a church that glories in our weakness so that God can give us strength that will become a testimony to all people that God is a redeeming, saving, restoring, actual, changing God and makes new people gives them new hearts and new spirits that they could not have on their own. Amen? Amen. Or we can just go, you know, smoke pot and drink beer and all that good stuff and, and act like somehow or another we're getting better, okay? Which is not going to work, right? It's not going to work. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit in the fellowship of believers 
gives us power, joy, and strength. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. As we sing this song, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you if there's something that you need to do about God in your life, if there's something you need to be honest about, if there's something you need to share with somebody else, if there's somebody you need to go to and say to them, look, I love you, let's not do this anymore. Uh, You need to ask somebody to fix something. Whatever it is that God's really leading you, what the Holy Spirit's really showing you, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let God work in your life.